Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here. Looking at the timeline of biblical history, um, this goes all the way back to Adam through to the end of the world as we know it. And in this video, I just want to walk you guys through this. Um, I'm calling this video a draft because I've been working on this for almost a week and I really need to do something else. So I'm going to go ahead and put this out. Now, in this video, what you're going to learn is our story, the history of the Israelites from Adam all the way through till the end of our 6,000 years and even beyond looking primarily at dates and the events that happened in those dates. We're going to talk about the Messiah's first coming as well as his second coming. We're going to be talking about the 144,000 and their roles in the tribulation. We're going to be breaking down a lot of Daniel's prophecies and other prophecies from the scripture, even those around the sabbatical year of 2023 and the jubilee year of 2024, briefly talking about what our requirements are in those years. We'll get hints about the birth of our Messiah and the timing of the physical manifestation of his return. We'll be talking a lot about biblical history around the time of Daniel's prophecies and the decrees and the rebuilding of the temple. So stick around. We, we got a lot to talk about. Go ahead and hit that like button and be prepared to leave a comment as we go. Now, all of this is original information. You know, that's important because, you know, if you see anything in here interesting, you know, and you and you find something online that agrees or disagrees. That's important that we share that information so that we can uh, get this straight. Now, I don't think there is any problem from Adam all the way down through the covenant or even down through 605, because, as you know, we did a class not too long ago where we looked at Jacob's trouble and it's important to understand the uh, timing there in 605 what happened there in the third year of Jehoiakim in 605 to understand the prophecy that Daniel was talking about there in chapter 12 Daniel chapter 12 um, we did that a number of years ago back in 2019 2020 but in this video we're going to continue on we're going to try to close the gap with the rest of the information that the Bible offers as far as these timelines and these dates are concerned. Now, one place we want to start, oddly enough, for those new to all of this, is the year 28 AD. Now, we're going to go over here to Luke 3, where we learned in verse 30 that our Savior was 30 years old when he began his ministry. And we can go back up to verse 1 and see when that was that his ministry started. When it was that he was about 30, well, that was in the 15th year of Tiberius Caesar. Now, according to Wikipedia, Tiberius started his reign September 17th of the year 14. So that would make the middle of A.D. 14, the first year of his reign. And if we go 15 years ahead, that'll put us in year 28 A.D. And now just to show you how that works here in Excel, I'll use the year 2014 because of the limitations of this computer. But we'll call that year one. And we see that by the time we get down to year 15, we're in the year 28. So that's pretty much our start point. That's the first correlation that we'll make with modern day history is right there in 28 AD with the first advent, the first coming of our Messiah. This is actually prophesied in the book of Daniel chapter 9 and verse 25. Now, in Daniel chapter 9, we start reading about these 70 weeks there in verse 24. Then Daniel starts explaining these 69 weeks in verse 25. 
Let me just read it. It says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. So you have to understand that the streets and the wall, even the temple was in uh, desolation at this point when Daniel is receiving this prophecy. But what he's talking about is our Messiah. And he's saying after these seven weeks and then these 62 weeks, our Messiah would appear. So we come over to the table. And so we have the Messiah appearing in 28 AD. So if we go back 62 weeks, we end up with the completion of the second temple in about 407 BC. We read about that in Ezra chapter seven, where we learn that this all happened in the seventh year of Artaxerxes. The king, this would have been the second Artaxerxes. And then continuing with Daniel chapter 9, verse 25, we have to go back another 49 years to see the decree there in 456 BC. Now, I know there's a lot of people that have 457 BC, but you have to remember that we're talking about months here. And I'm not really prepared to go into decimal places yet, which is necessary because like we said up here with Nebuchadnezzar, this was on the 10th day of the 10th month when you're talking about a small portion of the year. Well, by the time you get down to the temple being rebuilt, you're uh, having dedications either in the spring or the fall. So you have to add some decimal places. And like I said, I'm not ready to go into that level of detail yet. However, it is there. And, but this is supposed to be more like a draft. We make sure we have the bigger numbers correct before we start getting into the decimal places. Because it, as an end result, this is where we're going to find out when exactly our Messiah was born because these dates will have to match up just perfectly but we'll save that for another video so we'll, we'll make sure what we have in this one is correct first so let's just continue on so you have the decree there in 456 and then we have to go back to the first Artaxerxes in about 487 BC and for that we have to look at Nehemiah 13. Well, there may be other places, but this is one of the places where we hear about this 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon. Now, this is the first Artaxerxes. This is the who a lot of times the secular world will call Xerxes. This is the grandson of Cyrus the Great who like Cyrus is also friendly with Judah and all religious communities for that matter. And in the 32nd year, he once again gives a decree to rebuild Jerusalem. So we see that here in 487. So how this happens is you have Cyrus to give the first decree when he came on the scene. But if you remember, they went in and impeded their hands, made it difficult for them to actually get anything done. They tried. They stayed in Jerusalem for all of these number of years from Cyrus through King Darius all the way down to this Artaxerxes. The 32nd year of Artaxerxes does all of this um, um, weakening of the hands in. That's when they're actually allowed to go in and actually do work with the help of everybody around them. And of course, this came at the end of the desolation, the 70 years of desolation. And this is important to understand. Um, I, like I said, all of this is original. I haven't really looked at much of anybody's work, you know, except to give me the motivation to come in and, you know, try to f understand our, our 
father's scripture for myself. Um, and, I, and I have to remind you guys, I'm not a historian. I'm a math person. Uh, these, it's, these are numbers to me. And, but what's important to understand about this desolation, and I chose that word carefully, is because it includes all of this period, all the way back to the third year of Jehoiakim, when Nebuchadnezzar first came on the scene. Like we said, that was 605 BC. Matter of fact, let's go over to Daniel chapter 1 and let's read it. It says, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, came Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, unto Jerusalem and besieged it. We can read the whole story back in Second Chronicles or Second Kings chapter 25, where we learn um, more about the timing of this. And like we said, we, we did a lot on this 605 date, and I don't want to bore you guys to death, but... We probably got 12 videos on this verse alone. But what that is, is the beginning of the desolation. Because we can see over in Jeremiah that Nebuchadnezzar had several waves of periods where he took people out of Judah and into Babylon in his seventh year then in his 18th year and then in his 23rd year were three separate times that he carried people and or materials into Babylon. That was the desolation. And so this is what was the hardest for me to get my head wrapped around. And I think a lot of people are struggling with this, too, is that this 70 years does not start at a date. But it actually starts with a man. The whole reign of this Nebuchadnezzar is the time in which Jerusalem is made desolate. So in other words, it starts back here in 605, but it actually doesn't end until about 594. Let me, let me say that in a different way for those looking for the start date of the seven years. You can pin your start date of the 70 years anywhere between 605 BC and 557 BC, which was the reign of Nebuchadnezzar. And where I'm getting that this was the end of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar was that it was in this time in the 7th and 30th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah, did this evil Merodach, king of Babylon, lift up his head and basically brought him out of prison and put him in an elevated position there as the king of Judah. Now, this Jehoiachin was the king that followed Jehoiakim, who actually reigned for 11 years. But you remember it was in his third year that this Nebuchadnezzar came up and carried him into Jerusalem. The thing about Jehoiachin is that 18 years old, when he became the king, the first thing he did was turn himself over to the Babylonians. Note that he didn't kill Jehoiachin, he just locked him away and made Zedekiah the king. And then we learn in 2 Kings 25 and verse 27 that he was brought out of prison. Now, this is real interesting here uh, to note because some will catch on to this and they'll say, OK, well, their captivity period didn't last for a full 70 years because you see here that the king was lifted up and you say, well, how could the people still be oppressed and, and downtrodden if their king has been lifted up. And when we look at the uh, verses uh, following this, we see that he was lifted up above all the of the kings, above the throne of the kings that were with him in Babylon. So they elevated um, the Israelites to that point. They elevated Judah there in Babylon. Now, this is what I find interesting. Like I said, I'm a math guy. So watch this. 37 out of 70 years equates to about 53%. Now, when you look at the Abrahamic prophecy and the 400 years and how long they stayed in cattle slavery or whatever they called it, 
they were supposed to do 400 years. But if you multiply that times this 53%, you end up with more like 211 years. Okay, so let's start in about 1620 or whenever they say slavery started here in the United States. And then we're going to add these 211 days. And you see that it equates to the 1800s, about 1830, which is about the time when the slaves started to think about being freed here in America. I, I think the official date was about 30 years later. But you see my point, how it's very similar that those people spent about 50 percent of their time in slavery and then they were released to spend the rest of their time living there and serving the king of Babylon. That's important to understand is that they still had to stay in Babylon, according to the scripture of what they was told by Jeremiah, that they had to stay in Babylon and serve the king of Babylon, else they would be punished severely. Well, here's the case here in America, too, where these people were released in the 1800s um, in the 19th century, but yet are still here serving the king or the, the president of the United States um, in the same manner, tributaries to this king. Well, this is what we're there and expecting then is for, you know, this all to go down similar to the way it did back then, where you're going to have a new Cyrus who we know to be our Messiah this time and is actually going to uh, help us to make this transition same as they did before but anyway all of that to say a long way of saying this here is this desolation period is a it's a period that started in 605 and ended in 487 which is more like 118 years instead of just 70 years but anyway um like i said this is new information um and i appreciate any feedback uh constructive feedback anybody wants to offer but let's continue on um what this allows us to do now is to bridge the gap between our messiah and uh the old world, I'll say the 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 first temple, Solomon's temple, we're able to bridge the gap and even bridge the gap with the second temple, uh, Ezra's temple, I think it's called um, Zerubbabel's temple, same same guy. But the way we do that is we go back and look at the prophecy there in Daniel chapter nine in verse twenty seven. Where, where we see that our Messiah would be cut off in the middle of the week. There was supposed to be an additional week that started in 28 AD. That would have been the 70th week. There's only uh, 69 weeks in here. This was actually supposed to be the 70th week. The 70th week started in 28 AD. But it only lasted for three years or three and a half years before the Messiah was cut off. It says that he would confirm the covenant with many for one week. That's what he was doing there with the disciples for those three and a half years. He was teaching them the covenant, teaching them how to live within the covenant. And they had the mission of going out and teaching everybody else. It's the same way the 144,000 are today. They have the mission of learning the law and the rules so that when the end of this week comes, that was the beginning of the week with 12 of them. We're ending the week with 144,000 of them. And but they have the same mission of confirming this covenant so that they can now be the teachers of this multitude that no man can number. They can come out and teach the rest of us. And this is really important to understand that this covenant is our Messiah um, bringing his word to us. Now, what I find interesting is that, OK, the Messiah came on the scene as the king in the year 28 AD. That's when he came on a donkey riding everybody saying Hosanna uh, in the highest. Um, so he was declared king in 28 AD. But when we look at our biblical history of kings and how long they reign, we see that King David reigned 40 years. We see that King Solomon reigned 40 years. We see that Johash reigned for 40 years. And we see in verse 2 of 2 Kings that he did right in the sight of the Lord. Not many of those kings did right. But Joash was one. And that's probably the reason why he had a perfect 40-year reign. 
That's the reign of the kings. So when we look at the Messiah coming on the scene and being declared the king, and then fast forwarding 40 years later, what do we have? The temple once again being sieged. In other words, that's what he was talking about, the temple and his relationship with the temple. Even though they destroyed his body, he his reign was supposed to last until the end of the second temple. But this also, it should be noted, is this is why the 70th week is lasting for 2,000 years. He was supposed to come on and reign for 40 years as a fleshly king. But he was our Messiah and they killed him after three. One can say that empowered him to stretch out this week for 2000 years. So we look here, we fast forward to 68 AD when you have the so-called Zealot temple siege there in Jerusalem. Once again, the people standing up for their rights against the Romans. This time, like many others, they were defeated. But if you look at the pattern of things and look real closely at this, the 490 year pattern emerged. Because you have to remember that Jeremiah said that there would be 70 weeks, which is 490 years. And that was the beginning. And so if we look at this period here, 68 AD, as an ending, the time in which the, the temple was burned, our Messiah's temple was burned, his kingship would have came to an end. Then, and apply the pattern that we learn about in the book of Daniel. Like I said, this is, this is kind of a draft video, so it's kind of rough, I understand. But if we look and apply what we learned in the book of Daniel about the time, time and half a time, and what we learned in the book of Daniel on a time being 490 years, applying this all to the end of our Messiah's fleshly kingdom, what we see is that a time takes us to the Edict of Milan. That was the year after Constantine was made uh, emperor or basically what we would call the Pope, putting him over not only the religious world, but also the Israelite world under Hillel II, who basically changed the calendar and gained the approval of Constantine for the Jewish community with this new calendar. In other words, they got the head Jewish leader of the time, Hillel II, to create a ish, a Jewish calendar, which was approved by the Catholic leaders at the time, with the end result that the world now will have the mark of the beast. The, the beast being Constantine, the government system, and the mark being his new calendar system that he instituted over the years that all started there in 312 or in 313 with the Edict of Milan. We have to go in there and, and uh, look at that. And yeah, I left it as Edict of Melon just to let you know, like I told you guys, if I don't make a grammatical error, you know, it ain't my work. Um, but anyway, all of this is original. And, and so if we start there in 312 and go forward a time, we end up in 803 with the Byzantine Empire. And then the book says to go two times. So instead of 490 years, now we're going to go 980 years and end up in 1783 with the Treaty of Paris. When you read the Treaty of Paris, this is when America truly became America was when was with this Treaty of Paris there in 1783. So that would be the birth of this country that is now to be judged uh, here a half a time later, 245 years later, here in the year 2028. And that's where we conclude this here with these 28s. This video is brought to you by the Celestial Clock Calendar the official timepiece of the 144,000. Get your celestial clock calendar at coachinafight.shop.
or follow the links in the description below. And let me show you something else interesting about the year 2028. We're talking about the years of human history. Well, if we come in and count the creation year of Adam as year one, what we find is that year 28 is the 6,001st year of human history. In other words, that's the year in which we'll start the next 6,000 years of human history. So there is our 6,000 years of human history. But before we think of how far out the year 2028 is, let's talk about our current year, the year 2023. There's a lot we can do with this table here. Like for instance, using the book of Jubilees and what it says about the timing of when they crossed the river Jordan, we can determine our sabbatical years. Using the information that we get from the book of Jubilees, we see that they crossed the river Jordan in a Jubilee year, which was 1456 BC. But with that information, we can easily see that the year 2024 is also a Jubilee year and the year 2023 is a sabbatical year. Of course, it is important to know this because of our obligations, our requirements that we have in the sabbatical year, which is to read the book of the law during the Feast of Tabernacles and our requirements in the Jubilee year, which is to blow the trumpets on Atonement Day. These are both years of release, one for financial debts and personal freedoms, that being the sabbatical year and land being returned in the Jubilee year. So it's important to get these dates right. Maybe you'll want to go and watch this video again. And that reminds me, I went through this release on the last cycle, the last sabbatical year, seven years ago. And I say that to say I've really appreciated all of the support you guys have given throughout the years, allowing us to do this research through your charity. Now that our family is getting ready for this second cycle, we're not sure what the future holds, but I personally hope that it involves making videos for you guys. So make sure you subscribe just in case there is more to come. And shallow armor, if it ain't.